October is here, and there is a lot going on in Chatham this month. We are starting to get those wonderful warm days and cool crisp nights that we all love during the shoulder season. The town is still busy, but things have slowed down to a reasonable pace, and we can easily find a parking space downtown. October favorites are back again this year. The pumpkin patch at the Congregational Church, the blessing of the animals on Sunday the 7th, pumpkin people in the park, and the Oktoberfest festival on Saturday the 20th. I'm Huntley Harrison with Richard Garvin to bring you the October installment of Chatham Today. From time to time, we have special segments to highlight specific events or departments in the town of Chatham. Because October is Fire Prevention Month, we are privileged to have as our guest, Chatham Fire Department Chief Pete Connick. Please stay tuned for this interesting and topical interview on fire prevention, fire safety, and emergency management. But first, we'll provide you with the information you need to take advantage of what's happening during the month of October. The Chatham Council on Aging has a full slate of interesting activities and events during October. On Tuesdays during October from 2.30 to 3.45, you can take part in the TOPS program. TOPS stands for Take Off Pounds Sensibly, Chatham Chapter 409. Are you ready to stop dieting and start making real changes? Please join them on Tuesdays and start your journey now. Your first visit to the chapter is free. For more information, please contact TOPS 409 Chapter Leader Nancy Petrus at 508-255-0172. Thursdays, October 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th from 9 to 10 a.m., there will be a free blood pressure clinic. Transportation is available. Call the COA for more information. Also on Thursdays from 1 p.m. to 2.30, take Wing with Elsa Bastone and learn to create new life experiences. Wings is a program designed by Dr. Bastone to assist an individual to take action toward a goal that is desired but is fraught with ambivalence. These classes will involve identifying the resistances and learning to deal with them so that the individual can take action and take wing to create new life experiences. Reservations are required. Call to reserve your place in this valuable set of workshops. The first day trip for October will be on the 10th, departing at 9 a.m. You will get a chance to see the beautiful coastline and go to the National Seashore Salt Pond Visitor Center to browse the exhibits and visit the gift shop. This will be followed by lunch at the Knack Sandwich Shop. The trip will return to the COA by approximately 2 p.m. Transportation is free and admission is free. Lunch is at the cost of the diner. Reservations are required. Call as space is limited. There will be a Shine Medicare open enrollment presentation on Monday the 15th at 1 p.m. Medicare's annual open enrollment runs from October 15th through December 7th. Tracy Benson, Benson, Regional Shine Director, will present changes for plans available for 2019. Please call the COA to register for this important presentation. The second day trip of the month will be going to the JFK Museum in Hyannis, followed by lunch at the Black Cat Tavern. The bus will depart at 9 a.m. and return by 2. Reduced cost of museum admission is $6. Lunch is at the cost of the diner. Transportation is free. Reservations are required. Here's a nice treat. On Monday, October 29th, there will be a special Halloween luncheon party from 12 until 2.30. Following lunch, they will have the fun-filled activities. Don't forget to wear your best Halloween outfit. Prizes will be awarded. Tickets for lunch are $7. Reservations are required. This is sponsored by the Women's Club of Chatham. Taking care of someone with dementia is specialized work. The COA is offering a series of six consecutive free classes on becoming an expert in caregiving. They will start on Wednesday, October 31st, and continue on Wednesdays into November. The classes meet from 1 to 3. This is facilitated by the community service partners at the Elder Services Family Caregiver Support Program and Alzheimer's Family Support Center. 
Pre-registration is required. Please call Beth Gilmore at Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands. And uh, another program that starts in October and runs into November is the Fall Cooking Classes with Chef Heather Bailey. These will start on Wednesday the 31st and continue on the following consecutive Wednesdays. The class cost is $3 per participant per class, payable at the COA front desk. This program is generally generously supported by the Friends of the Council on Aging. Space is limited. Reservations are required. Call for further information. And now for the programs at the Eldridge Public Library for the month of October. On the Trail of Bonnie and Clyde with Chris Daly. Tuesday, October 9th at 7 p.m. This lecture, which is part travelogue and part history, will chronicle the story of Bonnie and Clyde, separating the reality from the myth. This one-hour lecture will tell that story through the use of period photographs and movies, plus modern photographs and video shot by Mr. Daly. He traveled through the states of Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, and Missouri, photographing and making a video of the sites of their homes, murders, robberies, shootouts, and hideouts. On Thursday, October 18th at 7 p.m., join them for the Palatine Wreck, the legends of the New England ghost ship with author Jill Farinelli. In 1738, a British merchant ship grounded in a blizzard on the northern tip of Block Island. Rumors of what happened on the ship soon turned into stories and folklore. Author Jill Farinelli reconstructs the origins of one of New England's most chilling maritime mysteries. On Tuesday, October 23rd at 7 p.m., come for the haunting of Cape Cod and the Islands by Barbara Sillery. Barbara Sillery's lively author presentation is ghostly gallivant, is a ghostly gallivant around the Cape Traveling from the Upper to the Lower Cape, the author will introduce a little girl ghost, a sea captain and his wife, as well as a female ghost who is on the lookout for fires. Sharing images from these intriguing chapters of her book, she will delve into the history behind the mystery of Cape Cod's historic sites. Now for some items of general interest. The pumpkin patch is back at the First Congregational Church during all of October. Drop by, purchase a pumpkin, and benefit the Children's Fund of Chatham and other church missions. October begins a special Faulkner exhibit at the Atwood House and Museum, a sampling of the works, photos, and memorabilia of Chatham's First Lady of Art, Marguerite Peg Faulkner. It will be featured for, from October 2nd through December 29th. Chatham Lighthouse Tours continue on Wednesdays from 1 to 3.30. The 14th Annual Autumn Sacrifice Art Sale will be held on October 5th and 6th at the Creative Arts Center. Purchase original artwork at everyday low prices. Come early for the best selection. And last but not least, the October Fest Festival on Saturday the 20th, sponsored by the Chatham Merchants Association. Chatham's Kate Gould Park will be teeming with thousands of people for the festivities. Crafts and games for kids, the Chatham Town Band, professional entertainers, food trucks, a beer trailer, <laughs> and so much more. Don't miss it. Now, as we mentioned earlier, we are pleased to have as our special guest, Chatham Fire Department Chief Pete Connick. Chief Connick, welcome to Chatham today. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. You so, because October is uh, Fire Prevention Month, and I guess there's a Fire Prevention Week during October, we thought it would be a good idea to have you here and, and talk a little bit about the, the, the fire department in Chatham, uh, how it relates to some of the other departments around the Cape, uh, what your, you know, your formal mission is, a little bit of discussion about fire prevention, fire safety, emergency management, uh, some of the challenges you have uh, as moving forward uh, in uh, Chatham. And of course, summertime brings its own challenges, but uh, just generally tell our viewers a little bit about the Chatham Fire Department. Well, the Chatham Fire Department uh, is made up of 28 wonderful men and women um, that provide a great service to all of the people in Chatham. Um, 
Over the years, we've grown to the size that we're at now, um, and I can see with our call volume that we may be looking at adding some more in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a great group of people. Um, the, more, the more time I've spent there, the smarter the people we hire seem to be. Um, the, uh, the millennials have, have done well by us. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does my heart good to walk into a room and having the paramedics having discussions about heart blocks and the efficacy of various medications um, when they could be watching TV or doing something else. So we really have a, a dedicated group of people. And, uh, That's reassuring. I, I'm proud to have them, but, but as the end users, you all should be pretty proud to have them That's as well. That's great. Yeah. Well, we know they do a great job, uh, you know, just from what I've witnessed, and, and uh, especially uh, the number of calls you get during the summer. Tell us a little bit about the summertime challenges. Well, the summertime challenges are based not just on call volume, but the way our calls come in. Um, we stack calls. Um, so we don't get one call and get to the hospital and come back. Um, we, we have three ambulances, and very often all three are out. Um, the problem that that presents for us is we don't have that number of staff on, so we rely very heavily on the off-duty members coming back in. Um, sadly, in the summertime, that's when they get to spend time with their family because the kids are out of school. So um, often there's a little bit of a conflict between family life and work life. I'm sure. Um, they are very dedicated. They come back as often as they can. But uh, that, that's truly how we are successful in getting through the summer. Um, this week has been an interesting week because we've been summertime busy. Uh, I have no explanation for why, but we've been stacking calls in the, in the same numbers as we did in the summertime. A little easier to get people back in now because the kids are in school, um, and it's really not prime vacation time. Right. But um, we would need a lot more people to be able to staff all of our apparatus without having to, to get call back. So, Using, using the, uh, the callback and overtime model is really the most efficient way um, that we can manage the, the calls and the staff level that we have. So are there, are there any, uh, given that, are there any volunteers? Well, there, there aren't volunteers. Uh, we have varying numbers of call firefighters. So to become a call firefighter, uh, you have to go to the fire academy, which is, um, it's, two or three nights a week and all day Saturday for three and a half to four months. Uh, and often when people hear of that commitment, um, they just can't fit it into their schedule. Additionally, uh, we like them to be EMTs. So uh, the EMT class is also going to be another three or four or five months. And we've trained a lot of people as call firefighters. Most of them find out that they like it a lot more than they thought they would, and they want full-time jobs. And um, in the fire service on Cape Cod, we, we steal from each other. So um, we hire people from other call departments, and they hire from our call department. So uh, at the moment, we have one that's just getting integrated into the system. Um, we don't have an active call member right now. Uh, but the, uh, the door is always open for people to come in and talk to us about getting that training. Oh, I'll be there. Yeah. Uh, you, you spoke about how they like the job once they get their hands on it. Now, how did you come to become a fireman? Was it always some, a goal of yours? Well, my family was always involved in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, I went to, uh, to school through junior high school, as we called it then, in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. And my family was involved in what we call emergency management. I was civil defense and with an ambulance service up there as well. When we moved to the Cape, um, my father got on the, uh, the call department in Wellfleet. Okay. And, uh, you listen to the radio, you listen to the stories, and, and it just sort of pulls you in. Oh, I uh, bet, I bet. So that, that's how I got pulled in. <laughs> yeah. And you started off basically as a, fire, a regular fireman. I was a, I was a call firefighter, call firefighter. In, uh, in Wellfleet mm -hmm. um, and got my paramedic while I was there. Mm -hmm. And as I said, most call firefighters want full-time jobs. And um, Chatham was the first job that came up. And... I've been here since 1979. Wow, we don't know. And never look back. Good, well, that's good. No. That's good. Speaking of kind of moving into the the ranks and call firefighters and things like that, tell us a little bit about professional development and how, you know, you mentioned the fire academy and then the commitment for that and then being an EMT and that commitment as well. And what kind of ongoing professional development do you all have? 
Well, we're very fortunate. We have a, a, a captain who does our fire training internally, um, and he's very active in getting in, um, writing lesson plans for all of the shifts. So every shift, the people on the shift do some training evolution, usually two or three. So we keep them, we keep them very active that way. For EMT and paramedic certifications, you have to recertify every two years. Um, and it's, it's two whole weeks for paramedic and it's one whole week for EMT. Uh, we also encourage our folks to go to the Brownsville County Fire Academy, which is partnered with the State Fire Academy. Um, a lot of the programs that they do at the State Fire Academy in Stowe, um, it's just inconvenient for our folks to go that far. They've moved a lot of them to Brownsville County. So we're also very active um, in sending our folks off to that. Uh, we encourage training. Um, it, it's, it's not easy to tell someone that they can't go to a class because they're all good classes. And um, we all gain from the experience of one. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just as one particular incident there, or, or thing I've noticed is that the new truck, the Quint, just to look at that looks complicated. I mean, I can imagine what it must be to run it and operate it and know what everything does. And I don't know how to do that, but that's okay. <laughs> they shouldn't okay. have me doing it. Um, yeah, that, there was a learning curve with that. That was our first ladder truck. Mm -hmm. um, happened to be a Quint. Um, we brought in people to do the initial training, and pretty much every day they're out training with that because that, that, that's a, a new piece of equipment for us, not just a new truck, but... Um, it's not something that we replaced and upgraded. It was something that we never had that we should have had. Um, oh, excuse me. How long would that truck last in service? I mean, what's the average life of a fire truck? Well, that sort of a truck with, with one relatively small rehab probably is 25 to 30 years. Oh, wow. So, That's long. Yeah. Um, the pumpers, they run a lot more um, to, to a lot of calls that the Quint would not go to. Uh, we like to keep them first line for... 10 to 15 years yeah. and move them to the, to the back of the line um, yeah. and roll another one in. Um, with those, we can, we can often get 20 plus years out of them. Um, the, uh, the maintenance is what's key. And, yeah. and yeah. Um, we spend a lot of money on maintaining the trucks, but yeah. I mean, a, a truck today is $600,000 or Ooh. more. So, wow. Yeah. That's expensive. Yeah, they're very expensive. And that's, yeah. and that's, Fully equipped or, or? Oh no, that's empty. That's what I thought. And, yeah, and it's it's empty. another hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars worth outfit. of equipment on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Quint was just south of a million dollars with no equipment on it. But, you know, yeah. and specialized equipment is very expensive. Oh, I'm sure. But without it, we can't do. It. Yeah, and and, and like you said, it, it, you do get payback because it lasts 25, 30 years. So that, that's good. Um, what about, what can we tell our viewers about fire prevention? What are some of the things? We're coming into the winter months, people are gonna have wood stoves, they're gonna have uh, maybe, you know, issues with uh, carbon uh, monoxide things. So things a like pop that. quiz for you folks. Why is uh, Fire Prevention Week always in October? I would, oh, I would, I, ah, I would, I would uh, guess. It's it. always the week of the great Chicago fire. Oh. October 6th was the great Chicago fire. No, I was gonna okay. say because we're going into the cold weather. Uh, no, <laughs> no, the great that's the Chicago fire. Yeah. Um, so they always pick that week for fire prevention week. Um, it's built on a terrible fire long ago. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so we do fire prevention and fire safety, um, which, are, which are two distinctly different things. We have a fire inspector mm -hmm. who does code enforcement, mm -hmm. um, and he partners with um, the building inspector. They do a lot of, of joint inspections and also with the electrical inspector. Um, so. They go into homes which are being sold. Um, it gives us an opportunity to make sure that the smoke detectors are still there um, and are operating correctly. All new construction, and um, depending on the type of, of commercial occupancy, we're through those at least once a year, and some of them uh, quarterly as well to get in there. So um, he's very busy. Uh, he, has, he has his hands full trying to keep up with the workload. Uh, particularly when real estate is, is moving, and it seems to be now. So. It seems to be, yeah. yeah. Um, fire safety, uh, we have several people that are, that are heavily involved with that. We have two programs that are part of the SAFE program. Um, we have SAFE, which we do in the schools, uh, and we have Senior SAFE, which we do with the Council on Aging. Um, so uh, Lieutenant Tavano is in the schools in the beginning of the year a lot, 
So he's in there several times a week uh, for the better part of a month, and then he gets in there less frequently throughout the year. But we, we hit hard with Fire Prevention Week. So we, we try and instill good habits in all the kids that are in school. Um, we also have a community risk reduction program uh, that Captain Reddy is involved with the, uh, the Council on Aging. We will go in and, and do a safety inspection in someone's house, um, install smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. Um, the Council on Aging has a representative that goes with us, uh, and we can bring in other assets like a building inspector or the Board of Health to help us um, get things um, squared away if they need to be. Um, it's, it's not a punitive visit. It's a, it's a safety visit that okay. we do. Um, and we really aim towards risk prevention and injury prevention with, with these programs. We're, we're trying not to have to go out with the ambulance and the fire truck. Yeah, if you don't yeah. have to. Right? Yeah, we're trying to get rid of our jobs, but um, <laughs> that never seems to happen. It's not going to happen. But, um, but we do get to get into a lot of homes and get to spend some time talking about the, the things that could be a little bit safer. Um, we also do that when we go on ambulance calls. We, we, we treat our, our patients as customers, not just patients, and we look around, and if the smoke detectors are down, we'll, uh, we'll offer to come over and put them back up to put batteries in it for them, yeah. um, because that, again, gets us into a lot more houses, so we can try and, and keep people safe while they're in there. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. And uh, I know last, last winter we had those three back-to-back -back nor'easters and we had flooding and uh, other issues that were related to that and lines down because of heavy snow and what have you. Tell us a little bit about emergency management and how that's, you know, how you all handle it within your department and perhaps how mutual aid works into that whole picture. Well, emergency management became something I was responsible for when I became fire chief. Okay. Um, so in order to do emergency management, you really need someone that can dedicate a lot more time than I could with all my other functions. So we recently hired an emergency manager um, who is more or less the behind the curtains guy, um, organizing all our plans, bringing people in to go over the plans. So with emergency management, um, we tend to activate that for really big events. And what we'll try and do is get in, in one room where we have um, the phones and all of the radios for police, fire, highway, and harbor master. Um, and that acts as the distribution point for the dispatch to various events. Because in storms like those winter storms and hurricanes, um, if you call because you think you're having a heart attack, um, we need highway or plow um, to clear um, trees, uh, snow, uh, with the flooding. It was to get specialized vehicles in there so we could get through the water. And in fact, with the flooding, we actually were making uh, rescues with our boat. Um, we have people that are on the FEMA team, um, and they were deployed to Houston. And the conditions that we had down um, on Little Beach were worse than they were dealing with in Houston when they were there, as far as the currents uh, and, the, and the, the dangerous environment that the people were getting stuck okay. in. Absolutely. So, um, that was that was educational for us. We didn't realize that we would be able to interact with those conditions here until the, the uh, beach broke through. Until that happened, yeah. Did, uh, I heard or I read that Chatham sent a team down to the Carolinas? We actually sent three people down. Uh, one of them went with the, the Massachusetts FEMA team. Okay. And two went, um, North Carolina put out a request um, to other states for um, specialized groups, and, um, we call it a technical rescue group, mm -hmm. and we had two others that went down with that. Um, they just got home at 3 o'clock this morning. They were down there for a week and a half. The FEMA team went down earlier and came back a little bit earlier. Yeah. They, were, uh, they were working in areas where there was 30 plus feet of water covering the roads. Wow. Um, and the areas that they were in, the people seemed to have gotten out, but um, atypically, many of them left their, their animals behind. Yeah. So they were searching house to house to make sure that there, there weren't people stranded or any victims inside. Mm -hmm. And they were evacuating a lot of, a lot of the animals that got left behind. Yeah. Um, some of them had been, been alone in the house or in the yard for a week or more, and they were happy to see people coming I'm in. I'm sure they were. Yeah. 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 So, the, the, yeah, it, it's interesting, but it's also helpful because we don't have to have the storm to, to build up our, our talent. Um, we can go other places, and and you know they come back and they do they do uh, a shift by shift lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Here's here's 
what we ought to start thinking about doing, and here's what really didn't work, so let's not try that here. So we, we can take advantage of that, and I'm happy to send people down because the, the more often we can help out in another place when, when we get hit, they'll be willing to come up and help us yeah. as well. And That's good. you know, if, if we had that kind of storm, we'd be needing a lot of outside help. Oh, so, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. Oh, sure. Do we have a high water vehicle? We do have a high water vehicle. We got a, a, a used military vehicle. And high water vehicle um, has different connotations. I always can get through three and a half to almost four feet of water. Um, so long as it's not the uh, the tide breaking through the uh, the beach, because that would right. also have swept that a little bit. Yeah. So that we did not have that um, with the with the flooding that we had last time. Um, not for not wanting one, but um, they've become very popular. The military isn't turning vehicles over as often as they used to, and when they do, it's hard to get them. But we were we were able to leverage one. So That's not good. it is it is, and uh, you know we've had everyone out training with it. So hopefully it just goes out for training and yeah. never has to yeah. be used but yeah. um, but we have it if we need it yeah well now earlier at the beginning we we talked about some of the challenges and i mentioned this summer but uh what other kinds of challenges does the fire department have these days well we have we have budgetary challenges just <laughs> yeah. like every other every department, every department. There's, yeah. you know there's, there's so many so many pieces of the pie right. um but but we do pretty well with that mm -hmm. um they've they've taken pretty good care of us got us good equipment um mm -hmm. Um, we were at full staffing, and for a while we weren't allowed to uh, to be at full staffing because of the budgetary issues. Um, other challenges? We don't have an awful lot of other challenges. It's the day-to-day -day, day go-to -day, calls. Right. The, yeah, yeah. The, the calls present small challenges, but yeah. um, because we we have such a great training program, uh, we're, we're not usually up against it. Yeah. That's good. I, oh, I'm so fortunate to have the you people are. that I yeah. do. Yes. It. Yeah, you know, I, I don't get calls in the middle of the night. Um, well, that's good. So yeah. you know, they, they they do their job they, they and they do, do it well. Take care of it. Yeah, and that that's really what you want. Yeah. So, given everything you've said, and, uh, anything you'd like to say to uh, the viewers as far as fire safety, fire prevention as the winter comes on? Well, um, if you're going to be using a wood stove or your fireplace, make sure someone checks your chimney. Um, the uh, the thing that we get called most often to when you have frequent use of a fireplace or a wood stove are chimney fires. And those can be complicated because to put a fire out, we have to use water, and water coming down your chimney ends up in your living room. Mm -hmm. um, so it's better to get a chimney sweep in to at least evaluate it and clean it up, and, and we can prevent that. Um, follow the manufacturer's instructions on not keeping flammables next to it. Um, right. and, uh, and have your furnace checked yeah. right. as we get into the, into the winter season. Yeah. Make sure, make sure your smoke detectors are up. You have a, a working carbon monoxide detector. Um, we've, we've had some, some tragic deaths over the years um, in houses that had smoke detectors but no, uh, no carbon monoxide detectors, and uh, it really is a big deal. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, I'd like to thank you uh, for being with us today and sharing some of the information about the Chatham Fire Department and what you do and, and the develop, prof professional development that goes on. And I think we're, we're pretty lucky to have a, a fabulous fire department here in Chatham. And that might speak to why we, you know, things kind of go very smoothly here in town. Well, I'm pretty lucky to have the department yeah. that I do. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I couldn't be happier. Um, stop in and say hello, our door's open. Um, we're very proud of our new firehouse and our, our pumpers and, and quint that we recently got. So yeah, come on in and look around. You paid for it. Come in we'll, and see we'll, it. We'll do come that. Come in and touch it. Right on. Well, thank you very much for, <laughs> for being Thanks. with us, yeah. and uh, we appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That wraps it up for this time. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Chatham Today. Remember, the show runs on public access channel 99 several times during the week. If you miss the cable cast or want to see it again, you can find us on Facebook and YouTube, or you can visit our website. Just do a Google search for site slash Chatham Today, and it should be the first entry you see. The web address is on the screen now. Chatham Today is a video chronicle of the events and activities in the town of Chatham. If you would like to have what's happening in your organization announced on the air, please email us. We look forward to hearing from you. You can also like us on Facebook at Chatham Today, and we certainly hope you do. Thank you for watching. 
We'll see you down the road.